Amen. If you have your Bible, please turn to Mark chapter 4. Mark chapter 4. I want to talk to you tonight about what to do when trouble comes. It was a number of years ago when I was on staff at Champion Forest Baptist Church in Houston. My, my journey was uh, kind of different than, than most guys. I, uh, <clears throat> I got saved when I was 17 years old, high school senior at Cypress Creek High School in Houston, Texas. I went to the University of Texas and uh, really started to grow in my faith at the University of Texas. And uh, my roommate in college toward the end, I had various roommates, but my, my junior year, uh, I had a roommate, and he was going to go into the ministry. And I began to pray, and I said, Lord, is that what you want for me? Because that was a desire in my heart. But I never felt called at that time. So uh, I said, well, I guess God doesn't want me to go, because if he wanted me to go, he'd call me. And so I went back to Houston, I got a job, and I got involved at Champion Forest Baptist Church, and that's where I met my wife, Debbie, and, uh, and so we got married, and we started having kids, and I was working in the chemical business, I was selling specialty chemicals for Nalco Chemical Company there in Houston, and uh, that's when the Lord really began to do a work in me. I was going through a, a Henry Blackaby study, Experiencing God. Some of you remember that study. And I just had a, a restlessness in my heart. And I just said, I know God has something more for me than, than what I'm doing right now. And I t- was teaching a Sunday school class, and I loved that. But uh, there was just a desire for more. And it was in July of 1995 where the Lord really made it clear that he wanted me in the ministry. And he said, Jeff, I'm calling you. And uh, I said, Lord, I, I'm, I'm willing to go. And he said, good, because now we have a deal. And I said, yes, Lord, and I need to tell Debbie about the deal. And uh, <laughs> so I went home that night, and I told her, I said, Debbie, the Lord's called me in the ministry. She goes, that's not God, that's Satan. You've heard from the devil. <laughs> she goes, we like our life. And uh, her Debbie's dad was a pastor, and so she lived that life, and she said, I don't want to do that. Uh, I, wouldn't, I, I didn't want to go out with preachers, uh, anybody wanting to go in the ministry, because I've lived that life, and I know what it's like living in the fishbowl. And so she said, uh, no, this can't be from God. Uh, and I said, okay, well, will you pray about it? She said, no, I'm not going to pray about it. I said, well, will you pray about praying about it? She said, all right, I'll pray about praying about it. And so she did. And after some time, the Lord really worked in her heart. And she said, well, here's the thing. I don't feel like I am called, but I feel like you are called, and I'm called to be your wife, and I'm called to support you. And so she said, we need to go to seminary. And so we went off to North Carolina to go to seminary. I was at, in seminary for a year at Southeastern Seminary in, in 1996. And then my pastor, Damon Shook, he called me from Champion Forest. He said, why don't you come on staff at Champion Forest, and I'll train you. You can go to the extension school. Southwestern had an extension school. And so that's what we did. And I went back. And, and the first summer I was there, I went to a conference in California with some of the other staff. Champion Forest is a large church, and some of the other staff and I, we went to this conference, and it was a great conference. We were learning lots of new things. And then uh, most of the guys had to go back because we, uh, they had to get back for their Saturday night service. We had a Saturday night service. And I didn't have to be back for the Saturday night service, and neither did Tony, my friend, who was the associate worship pastor. And so we said, well, let's hang around. We'll go to church here at, at, the, uh, at Saddleback. That was where the conference was. And... Uh, so it sounds great. Well, we had uh, pretty much a whole uh, three quarters of a day that we didn't have to do anything. Saturday in the Los Angeles area, Southern California. So we said, um, what should we do? And Tony was from Florida, and he said, let's go to Universal Studios. He said, they have a Universal Studios in Florida. He said, it is so fun. We'll go to the one out here. And I said, I've never been. I was like, yeah, let's do that. That sounds fun. And he said, let me tell you, Jeff, they have a ride. It's called Back to the Future. It is such a cool ride. He said, when I was in Florida, there weren't very many people at the park one day. And he said, I just got to ride that over and over. And he said, it was so fun. I said, great. I'd like to do that. And I said, Tony, now I have a problem with balance and the inner ear situation. So is this a ride that spins you around or anything like that? He goes, no, you'll love it. And so, uh, so we go to the park, and we're 
standing in line for the ride. And, uh, you know, it should have tipped me off when I saw the sign that says this ride is not for pregnant women or pastors with inner ear problems. Um, <laughs> And so it, it, some of you may have been on this ride. So you go to it, and it's a DeLorean car, just like Back to the Future. And I think they had four seats in front and four seats in back. And the doors, you know, they open like that. And so you get in, and, and two people got in here, and there was Tony, and there was me, and then they closed the door. And I'm sitting there thinking, what is this ride? And all of a sudden, you see this screen, and the car picks up, and you're watching the screen, and you're moving this way and this way and going this and this. And I was on the ride for like 20 seconds. And I said, I've made a terrible mistake. This is not good. And after about 40 seconds, I began to sweat. And I started to turn green. And I thought, I think I'm going to throw up. And I, 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 it was a foregone conclusion at that point. I'm going to throw up. And I started to think, where am I going to throw up? I looked over at Tony. And he looked at me and saw me that I was all green. And he thought that was so funny. He was laughing. But you know, there's nothing like a little vomit to wipe a silly grin off your face. And uh, so I began to look to say, where am I going to throw up? I looked at the right, and, you know, there was the car door. I don't want to throw up there. And I looked in front of me. I said, no, that's not good. It could splash back. And then I looked at Tony. I said, well, he's, he's got it coming to him. So I was looking. I was looking. And, it's bad to say, but this is true. I mean, I was thinking, where exactly should I throw up on Tony? <laughs> and when I looked to see where I should throw up on Tony, out of my left eye, I saw the back wall of the ride. It was the only thing that wasn't moving. And so I said, if I just stare at the back wall, maybe I can get through this ride. And that's what I did. And I stared at the back wall, and I got through it. You know, the ride only lasted probably four minutes. It seemed to last for four days. I was on a bad ride, and I wanted off. Have you ever been on a bad ride in life? Everything seems to fall apart. Everything goes wrong, and you say, God, what is going on here? Get me off of this ride. Do you remember the cartoon, The Jetsons, where George Jetson gets on that uh, whatever that thing was, when he was walking Astro, and uh, he said, help Jane get me off this crazy thing because it just kept going. Maybe you're on a bad ride like that where you just say, help, Lord, get me off this crazy thing. I don't like this ride in my marriage. I don't like this ride in my career. I don't like this ride in my finances. I don't like this ride in my church. Hey, everyone can relate to trouble. Job 14, verse 1, man who is born of woman is short-lived and full of trouble. Job 5, verse 7, man is born for trouble as sparks fly upward. Job is the book of trouble, and we all can relate to that. But here's the thing, what do you do when trouble comes? You know, we read uh, stories and we hear testimonies and when trouble comes to your friend or trouble comes to your neighbor or trouble comes to someone you know, but what do you do when trouble comes to you? It doesn't knock on your neighbor's door, it knocks on your door. It comes to your doorstep. What to do when trouble come, comes? Well, in Mark chapter 4, there is a, an account that is given of Jesus with the disciples on the Sea of Galilee, and there's a storm, a serious storm, a severe storm, a storm that is so bad that the disciples, many of them experienced fishermen on, from the Sea of Galilee, Peter and James and John, they thought they were going down. This is the account from Mark's gospel. Mark chapter 4, verse 35. And on that day, when evening had come, he said to them, let us go over to the other side, the other side of the Sea of Galilee. And leaving the multitude, they took him along with them just as he was in the boat, and other boats were with him. And there arose a fierce gale of wind, and the waves were breaking over the boat so much that the boat was already filling up. And he himself, Jesus, was in the stern asleep on the cushion. And they awoke him and said to him, teacher... 
Do you not care that we are perishing? And being aroused, he rebuked the wind and said to the sea, Hush, be still. And the wind died down, and it became perfectly calm. And he said to them, Why are you so timid? How is it that you have no faith? And they became very much afraid and said to one another, Who then is this that even the wind and the sea obey him? I want to share with you four encouragements tonight from this text. Encouragements that that speak to our hearts on this question, what to do when trouble comes. Encouragement number one, when trouble comes, remember his promises. Remember his promises. Now, here's the story. Jesus has been teaching all day. And we read in, at the beginning of Mark chapter, uh, or in Matthew's gospel, when he tells about this story, that Jesus, there were so many people that he, he was in a boat. He said, push it out a little bit so I can uh, talk to the multitudes because they were crowding around him. So he got some distance so he could talk to the multitudes. He is teaching all day from the boat. And then it says in Mark's gospel, when evening had come, they told the multitudes, okay, uh, it's time the service is over now. You guys go. And he told his disciples, let us go over to the other side. Matthew says he gave orders to depart to the other side. And along the way, there is a serious storm. I mean, it is the worst storm perhaps that they had ever experienced and uh, it, it says that it was a, a seismos. That's the Greek word that is used in Matthew's gospel for storm, which is also translated an earthquake, a tempest. It, it, the, the sea is just roaring and the waves are uh, crashing into the boat. It says that the boat was covered with waves. I mean, they thought for sure they were going down. How do we know that? Because they said, Lord, do you not care that we are perishing? We're going down. Now, what did Jesus say? What did he say to them? He said, let us go over to the other side. He gave orders to depart to the other side. He didn't say, hey, guys, come in the boat with me and let us go to the middle of the Sea of Galilee and drown. No, he said, we're going over to the other side. Really important when you're in a storm and when the wind is blowing hard and when the waves are crashing into your boat, so to speak, that you remember what the Lord has promised. Listen, Solomon said this in 1 Kings chapter 8, verse 56. Blessed be the Lord who has given rest to his people Israel according to all that he promised. Not one word has failed of all his good promise which he promised through Moses his servant. Not one word. When God gives his word and when he gives his promise, we can take it to the bank. That is going to happen because God said it. And God cannot lie. You remember his promises in the storm. What has the Lord promised you? What has he said? You can cling to that. Did you know that the Bible, really when you think about it, it's kind of a, a big book of promises. So you can almost think about it like a checkbook of promises. 2 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 20 says this. For as many as may be the promises of God... In him, in him means Jesus. In him, in Jesus, they are yes. That, that's like saying, okay, God gives a promise. God writes a check, and Jesus signs the promise check. This is a promise for you. Acts chapter 2, verse 39, Peter said, For the promise is for you and for your children and all who are far off, as many as the Lord our God shall call to himself. The promise is for you. And the, God says, this is a promise from my word. And Jesus says, that's right. And he signs his name to it. And he hands you that promise, just like a check. Now, suppose Pastor Brad said to me, Jeff, you're only going to be here one more night. And uh, we, we can't wait for the offering. I want to give you a personal check from me and my wife and my family for $50,000. I'm just planting a seed. I mean, just... <laughs> so this is just make-believe, right? And so I say, well, Pastor Brad, 
if you insist. And so he writes me a check for $50,000. Now, for that check for $50,000 to make any difference in my life, two things have to happen. Number one, he has to have $50,000 in his account, right? If he's got 50 bucks in his account, it could be for $50 million. It doesn't matter. I just dribble it all you know, to the bank because it's going to bounce everywhere. So he's got to have the money. And number two, I have to cash the check. If he's got the money and he gives me a check and I say, oh, that is so great, and I put it in my Bible and I just leave it there, well, it, it's just a piece of paper. I have to go to the bank and cash the check. Now, when it comes to God, he has the resources to pay on every promise in his word. The question is not, does God have the wherewithal to pay? The question is, are we cashing the check? For as many as may be the promises of God, in him they are yes. Wherefore also by him is our amen to the glory of God through us. What does that mean? That means that you take that check and you endorse that check and you say amen to that promise and you say, God, I'm here and you have promised me this and I'm saying amen and I'm cashing this check. I am clinging to your promises. Hey, when trouble comes, very important, when trouble comes, you remember what God has promised. Remember his promises. Second encouragement. When trouble comes, you remember his presence. His presence. They're in a storm, they're in a boat on the stormy sea of Galilee, and who is in the boat with them? Jesus. He is in the boat. The Bible makes that clear. Verse 36, and leaving the multitude, they took him along with them just as he was in the boat. Just as he was in the boat. What does that mean? He had been teaching from that boat all day. So he was just in the boat. He, they came along with him. And other boats were with him. Verse 38, and he himself was in the stern asleep on the cushion. He was in the boat. Now you say he's asleep in the boat. That's the whole uh, big part of the story. He's asleep in the boat. Yeah, he's asleep in the boat because he's got everything under control. He's not worried. He's not bothered. He's in control and he is at peace. You remember his presence. Now listen, your troubles... No matter how great they are, they cannot drown you if Jesus is in the boat. You're not going to drown when Jesus is in your boat. The waves can crash and the wind can roar. It's okay because he is in your boat. David said, Psalm 23, the Lord is my shepherd. I shall not want. He makes me lie down in green pastures. He leads me uh, beside the still waters. He restores my soul. He guides me in the paths of righteousness for his name's sake. And even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I fear no evil for you are with me. Now, you know what's interesting about that? Psalm 23, the Lord is my shepherd. I shall not want. He makes me lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside quiet waters. He restores my soul. He's talking second person. And then when he gets in trouble in the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil for you are with me. Man, it's personal. And God is there with you. And the Lord says in Hebrews 13, 5, I will never leave you, nor will I ever forsake you. Not only is he with us, he says, I will be with you, and I'll never leave you, and I'll never forsake you. Now, Hebrews 13, 5, that's how it reads in our English Bible. That's not how it reads in the Greek. Because in the Greek, it has five negatives in there. And and this is what it would read in the Greek. I will not, never, never leave you, and I will not, never forsake you. Now, you turn in an English paper, and you write, I will not, never, never do this, I will not, never do that. Your teacher would say, this is terrible. You can't use double and triple negatives. Oh, where did you learn this stuff from, honey boo boo? I mean, it just wouldn't work. It it makes for terrible English, but it makes for great theology. Because God is saying, as it reads in the Amplified, for he himself has said, I will not in any way fail you, 
nor give you up, nor leave you without support. I will not, I will not, I will not in any degree leave you helpless, nor forsake you, nor let you down, relax my grip on you, assuredly not. That's what God is saying to us. And so we can know that he is with us. And as he says in the book of Isaiah, when you pass through the waters, I will be with you. And through the rivers, they will not overflow you. When you walk through the fire, you will not be scorched, nor will the flame burn you. For I am the Lord your God, the Holy One of Israel, your Savior. Do you remember in Daniel chapter 3 when King Nebuchadnezzar built the the long, skinny statue uh, and he wanted everybody to worship it. It was on the plains of Dura. And he says, hey, get, get, gather around. He had his whole kingdom come and uh, sit by the plains or gather around the plains of Dura, this, this idol that he made. And he had his band there. And he said, hey, everybody, when I strike up the band, that's when you bow before my golden image. And so they struck up the band. And everyone bowed except for Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. And so it was told King Nebuchadnezzar, and, and he had said, if you don't bow, I'm going to throw you in a furnace of blazing fire. And what God is there who can deliver you from my hand? And so they told Nebuchadnezzar, they said, hey, there are three Hebrew boys, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, and they don't uh, worship your gods, and they don't listen to what you say, king, and they didn't bow down. And Nebuchadnezzar said, is that right? And so he brought Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego to himself, and he said, is what I'm hearing true? Did you not bow down? Listen, I'll give you another chance. And when I strike up the band, you bow down. And if you don't bow down, I'm going to throw you in a furnace of blazing fire. And what God is there who can deliver you from my hand? And Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego said, we don't need to give you an answer concerning this. Our God whom we serve is able to deliver us from your hand. And, even, and he will deliver us, but even if he doesn't for, deliver us, let it be known that we will not bow down to your image nor worship your gods. Amen. Nebuchadnezzar got mad. He got really mad. The smoke started coming out of his ears. And he said, uh, heat up the furnace seven times hotter. And bind up Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego and throw them in the furnace. And so they did it. And they heated it up seven times hotter. And the the poor guys that had to throw Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego in the fiery furnace, they were consumed by the flames because it was so hot. And then Nebuchadnezzar looks into that fiery furnace and he says, Did we not throw three men tied up in the fiery furnace? And all his little sycophants said, Certainly, O king. And they said, then why do I see four men loosed and walking around, and the fourth man is like the Son of God? Jesus was in their fiery furnace, and he'll be in your fiery furnace. Because if you know him, and if he's in your boat, if he's in your life, he'll never leave you, and he'll never forsake you. And even though you walk through the valley of the shadow of death, you don't need to fear any evil, because he is with you. So when trouble comes, you remember his promises. What has God said? You remember his presence. He is with you, and your troubles can't drown you when Jesus is in your boat. And then thirdly, encouragement number three, you remember his passion. You remember how he passionately loves you. Now, here's the picture. They're in this terrible storm. Jesus is asleep. They're in this terrible storm. The waves are coming in. And they're bailing, and they're rowing, and they're sweating, and they're fearing. And as they're bailing out the water, uh, three more buckets come through. I mean, it's just the, the waves are just covering the boat. And the boat is filling up with water. You know, you can only take so much on so much water before you sink. And so they said, we're perishing. And they look back, and there's Jesus, and he's asleep. And so they said, well, somebody needs to wake Jesus up. It'd be terrible to die in your sleep. You know, let's wake him up so he can get ready to die. And so they, they probably had Peter do that. You know, he always did the dumb things. And so it's like, all right, I'll go wake him up. And he, so he wakes him up. And here was what they said to him. Lord, do you not care that we are perishing? You think about that. Lord, do you not care? Lord, I'm in a terrible storm, and you're asleep. Do you not care? I'm dying here. Do you not care? Do you not care about me? You know, most of the time we don't verbalize that to the Lord. 
but it's, it's inside. It's in our hearts when we're going through the tough times. And we're wondering, God, where are you? God, why are you asleep? Uh, as, as David said in Psalm 13, Lord, give me light in the darkness lest I die. Don't you care that I'm, I'm in such a tough spot? I feel like I'm dying here. I feel like I'm perishing. Well, when you say that to Jesus, do you not care about me? It, it's almost like balling up your fist and punching the Lord right in the heart. And he says to you, wait a minute, you're, you're asking me? If I care for you, do you see my hands? Big holes in his hands where they drove the spike through his quivering palms. He shows you his feet, holes in his feet where they nailed him to the tree. He he lifts up his tunic and shows you the hole in his side where they thrust the spear and the blood and water flowed. He said, do you see all this? He said, I did all this because I care so much for you, because I don't want you to perish. The Bible says we cast all our cares upon him. Why? Because he cares for us, because it matters to him concerning you and concerning me. Oh, he cares. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believes in him should not perish. Well, the question comes into play. Well, if God cares so much for me, why is he asleep when I need him the most? Lord, give me light in the darkness lest I die. Why is it like this? It's a good question. Why does God seem to hide when we're in trouble? I think that the answer to that question can be found in the book of Job. You know, Job, man who had everything. I mean, there was nobody like Job. God was bragging on Job to Satan. Have you considered my servant Job? There's nobody like him. He he serves me. He loves me. He fears me with all his heart. Satan said to God, well, God, the only reason Job serves you, the only reason he loves you, the only reason he fears you is because you're a sugar daddy. You bless him so much. You're a sugar daddy, but if you take away the sugar, he'll curse you to your face. God says, you don't know, Job. He'll never do that. Well, the the test was on. And Job, in chapters 1 and 2, he lost his family, all 10 of his children, just like that, in one day. He lost his fortune, bam, just like that, in one day. And then he loses his physical health. He's covered in sore boils from the crown of his head to the soles of his feet. And then he loses his face in the community. He says, the lowest of the low, the guys that I wouldn't even hire to work in my fields, now they don't cease to spit in my face. He lost his family. He lost his fortune. He lost his physical health. He lost his face in the community. And it all came at one time. And Job asked God, why? Why is this happening? Why aren't you intervening? Why are you asleep in the midst of all this? See, he didn't know that there was something going on between God and Satan. And he was the, the middleman. There, He didn't know any of that. We know when we read the story, he didn't know that. He just knew his life was falling apart, and God seemed to be a million miles away. And so in Job chapter 3, he asked the question over and over and over again, why, 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 why? Remember this, God is not in the business of explaining. He's in the business of sustaining. You read the book of Job And you will find that God does not answer Job's whys one time. Not once. He doesn't answer Job's whys. And you say, well, why doesn't he answer Job's whys? Why doesn't he answer our whys? Because God's ways are not our ways. And you and I have a, we have a mind the size of a teacup. The smartest one of us, the size of a teacup. You know how big God's mind is? It's like the Pacific Ocean. And so he's got this massive, I mean, you ever look at the Pacific Ocean, if you ever go out west and you see it, I mean, it's just as far as the eye can see, just water, water everywhere. 
That's the mind of God. It's unfathomable. His knowledge, his wisdom, his understanding. And we come before the Pacific Ocean with our teacup, and we demand answers from God. Why is this happening? And the Lord says, you know, I can't get the Pacific Ocean in your teacup. You don't have the capacity to understand what I'm doing, so why don't you just trust me? Trust me. My friend Babby Mason wrote a song. I love it. It says this, all things work for our good, though sometimes we don't see how they could. Struggles that break our hearts in two sometimes blind us to the truth. Our Father knows what's best for us. His ways are not our own. So when your pathway grows dim and you just don't see him, remember you're never alone. God is too wise to be mistaken. God is too good to be unkind. So when you don't understand, when you don't see his plan, when you can't trace his hand, trust his heart. God is a good God who loves you and loves me. Hey, what to do when trouble comes? You remember his promises. You remember his presence. You remember his passion that he really does love you. And lastly, you remember his power. God is the God who can do anything. Verse 39, and being aroused, he rebuked the wind and said to the sea, hush, be still. And the wind died down and it became perfectly calm. And he said to them, why are you so timid? How is it that you have no faith? And they became very much afraid and said to one another, who then is this that even the wind and the sea obey him? Jesus is awakened. He says two words in the Greek. It's translated, hush, be still. But he is awakened. He comes from the back of the boat to the front of the boat and says, hush, be still. And immediately it becomes perfectly calm. Now, think about this. See, it's, it's, that's a great miracle to speak to the wind and the waves and say, hush, be still. You can stop the wind, but you know, when water has been agitated and you quit blowing on it, it doesn't immediately just go calm unless you're God and you can tell water immediately get in your place. That was, that's the miracle. And it's like, whoa, who then is this that even the wind and the sea obey his voice? But before they said that, he said to them, why are you so timid? Why are you so afraid? Why are you so filled with cowardly fear? How is it that you have no faith? Now, in this story, there is an interesting Greek word. It doesn't show up, obviously, in the English, but it's a little word, megas, M-E-G-A-S. Megas is used three times in this account. It's used, and megas is just a word that means great. You know, we, we have that word in English. We got mega, megabyte, megaton, megaphone. It means great. I had a mega big lunch today. Maybe you did too. It means great. And so that word is used three times in this story. It's used to describe the fierce gale of wind. The Bible says in verse 37, and there arose a fierce gale of wind. That's a megas gale of wind. And then it's used to describe the calm, and it became perfectly calm. Megas calm, a great calm. And then it's used in verse 41 to describe the fear and the awe. They became very much afraid. Megas afraid and said to one another, who then is this that even the wind and the sea obey him? Megas, megas, megas. What's the lesson there? There are great storms that come to your life, that come to my life. And the Lord Jesus can speak a word in your great storm to bring about a great calm so that you would have great awe, so that you would understand he is the great God who can do anything in your life if you'll just trust him. That's who God is. Behold, I'm the Lord, the God of all flesh. Is there anything too difficult for me? And the answer, our Lord God, thou hast made the heavens and the earth by thy great power and by thine outstretched arm. Nothing is too difficult for you. See, God uses trouble in your life and my life to help us see him more clearly. 
Now, these guys had seen him do great things. They saw him heal the sick. They saw him uh, touch the leper. They saw him uh, raise the dead. They saw him uh, feed the multitudes. But they didn't know he could speak to the storm, that he could speak to the sea and hush the wind and the sea. They didn't know he could do that. But now they did. Who then is this that even the wind and the sea obey him? You know, it's interesting. Mark chapter 4, Matthew chapter 14, another storm on the Sea of Galilee. This time Jesus is not in their boat. This time Jesus comes walking on the water to them. And they recognize him. First, they don't recognize him. They think it's a ghost. They cry out for fear. And then they hear Jesus' voice. And Peter says, Lord, if it's really you, bid me come to you on the water. And Jesus says, come. And he goes out on the water. And he's doing good till he sees the wind and becomes afraid and begins to sink. And he cries out and says, Lord, save me. And Jesus immediately stretches forth his hand and brings Simon Peter to himself and said, Oh, ye of little faith, why did you doubt? And he takes him back to the boat. And when they get in the boat, the Bible says, and they worshiped him and said, of a truth, you are the son of God. So from who then is this to you are the son of God. Hey, God uses trouble in your life and mine to help us see him more clearly. And God uses trouble to test our faith. A faith that can't be tested, can't be trusted. And the Lord is testing our faith just like he tested their faith. And then God uses trouble to show us that he can do anything in our lives. I love this story. I heard it years and years and years ago about the missionary Darlene Dibler. She was a missionary in Indonesia. And she was there right before World War II doing great work with the uh, in, in Papua New Guinea area in Indonesia, and then World War II broke out. And the Japanese came, and they took over her camp. And they took Darlene from her mission work, and they put her in a uh, concentration camp to do back-breaking labor for the Japanese. And she said it was very, very difficult. And she was there with her missionary friends uh, in, in this camp. And then one day they accused Darlene of being a spy. And they said, what do you know about Morse code? She said, I don't know anything about Morse code. And they said, no, you're lying. We saw you out in the woods giving Morse code to our enemies. And she said, no, that was, I didn't do that. And they said, we have ways of making you talk. And so they took her from the concentration camp, which was no day at the beach, and they took her to a prison camp, and they put her in death row. And Darlene said, every day they would beat me and interrogate me, and interrogate me, and beat me. She said, I never cried one tear before my captors. But she said, when they would leave me in my cell, I cried buckets of tears. And I said, God, why? Why am I here? Why is this happening? Well, she said, one day, she was so sick with malaria. She said, you know, I was so skinny, all they gave me to eat was rice porridge with worms in it. And she said, and I had to, that's all I had to eat. And so I ate the rice porridge and I ate the worms. And she said, if you threw up, they would make you eat the throw up. And so she said, I was very, very careful to not do that because that had happened. It was horrible. She said, so one day I am there in the, my prison cell. I have such a high fever. She said, I need to get some air on my face. And she said, there was a window in my cell, but it was up high. So she said, I kind of uh, pushed myself up on the bed and put my feet on the, on the little knob there so I could get my face up. And she said, I was trying to get a little wind on my face. And she said, I looked out into the courtyard and she said there were other women there at the prison, but they weren't in death row like I was. And she said, I saw this one woman, and she was uh, looking kind of uh, like th there was something going on. She was kind of moving, uh, you know, stealthily along. And she said, I watched this woman. She was wearing a coat, and uh, she went to the fence. And she said the fence was covered in Honolulu creeper. And she said, all of a sudden, I saw this hand come through the fence and give this woman a small stalk of bananas. And she said the woman put those in her cloak and scurried off. And Darlene said when she saw the bananas, it just created in her such a hunger for bananas. 
And she said, oh, I could just smell them. I could just taste them. And all I had was rice porridge. She said, I immediately got down and got on my knees. And I began to pray and say, oh, God, that woman has bananas. And she said, God, I'm not asking you for a stalk of bananas like she has. God, could you bring me one banana? Just one banana. And then she started going through her mind. She said, now who could bring me a banana? And she thought about this guard. No, he would never do that. And this person, no, he would never do that. And this person, no, if he did that, they would probably find out and then he'd be killed. And she was just kind of trying to help God along which person, God, you should get to bring me a banana. And then she got to the end and she just said, God, why did I pray for a banana? There's no way that you could get a banana in here to me. This is just ridiculous. She said, God, I just want to be thankful for the rice porridge with worms because I could have nothing to eat. So, God, thank you for what you've given me. Well, she said the next day she was in her cell and she said, I heard some officers coming to my cell. She said, you could always tell the difference between the officers versus just the regular soldiers because they had different boots and they sounded different. And she said, I heard them coming and I knew that when the officer comes to your cell that you have to bow at 90 degrees, just so. And if you don't bow correctly, you would get brought back to the interrogation room and beaten. And so she was praying. She said, Lord, they're coming. Lord, help me to bow just in the right way so that I don't get beaten. I just don't think I can endure another beating. And she said they opened up the cell and she saw Mr. Yomaji. Mr. Yomaji was her camp commander at the concentration camp. Mr. Yomaji was someone Darlene had witnessed to. Mr. Yomaji listened to her testimony. Mr. Yomaji responded. Darlene said, I knew that man was my friend. And she said, when I saw his face, I jumped up out of bed and I clapped my hands and I said, Mr. Yomaji, it's like seeing an old friend. And he smiled at her. And then he looked at how sick she was and how skinny she was and how she was just racked with disease. And he didn't say anything, but he took those other Guards, and he took them outside the cell. And Darlene said, I didn't understand everything he said, but he, would, he began to dress those guys down for how terrible they were to Darlene. And then he went back into the cell and he said, Darlene, do you have anything for me to tell the women at the camp? And she said, yes, Mr. Yomaji, you tell those women I'm still trusting Jesus. Amen. They'll know what that means And I know you know what that means. And he nodded his head, yes. And then he turned around and left. And she could hear the big main gate slam. And she knew that Yamaji was gone. And then it dawned on her, oh, no. I forgot to bow. She said, God, why didn't you help me remember to bow She said, I didn't bow before those officers, and now with Yomaji gone, they're going to come back here, and they're going to beat me. And she said, God, I don't think I can handle another beating. And she said, sure enough, she heard those boots turn and come back toward her cell. And she prayed, and she said, God, give me the strength to handle another beating. And they opened the door of her cell. They threw it in. It was bananas. It was a stalk of 92 bananas. Darlene said she spread them out all over her cell. And she counted them. And then she said, I have never felt so much shame in the presence of my Lord. And she said, God... I don't deserve one banana. I prayed yesterday, and I didn't believe you could get me one banana. And now I have 92. And she said the Lord spoke to her heart so sweetly and said, Darlene, don't you know that I delight 
to do exceeding abundantly beyond all that you could ask or think. Those bananas are for you, and you enjoy them. Hey, listen, God is able in the worst of situations. He is able. There's nothing that he can't do. So I want to ask you, as you think about your life, as you go over the difficulties in your life, are you remembering his promises? Are you remembering his presence? Hey, is he really present in your life? Do you really have a personal relationship with Jesus? So many people have churchianity. They don't have Christianity. They know about God in their head, but they've never received Christ as Savior and Lord. If that is you, then that can happen tonight. and You can be born again, and Jesus can come in your life tonight. Remember his promises. Remember his presence. Remember his passion. He really does love you. And remember his power. He is the God who can do anything if we'll just trust him. Father in heaven, thank you so much for your love for us. Thank you for your grace. Lord, we we know that in a room with this many people, there are lots of needs, there are lots of hurts. There are a lot of people, no doubt, that are going through a bad ride in life. They're going through a storm in life. Lord, as it has been said, we're either entering a storm in a storm or just exiting a storm ready to enter another storm. Man who is born of woman is short-lived and full of trouble. So, Lord, in our trouble, help us to trust you. Help us to believe you for big things. Help us to know that you're the God who can do anything. Help us to cling to your word and stand on your word. Father, I just want to pray that each person right now would really search their hearts to know for certain, do I really belong to Jesus? Lord, as your word says, examine yourselves to see whether you be in the faith. And Lord, if, if the answer is no, I pray tonight would be the night that they would say, just with blind Bartimaeus, Jesus, son of David, have mercy on me. Save me. I thank you, Lord, that when I was a high school senior, I prayed that simple prayer. Jesus, would you save me? And you did. And you'll save anybody who will call out to you in repentance and faith. Lord, have your way as we sing. Have your way in this time of invitation. God, I pray that there would be many people that would come to the steps tonight. And just lay down their burden. As you've told us in your word, cast your burden on the Lord and he will sustain you. He will never allow the righteous to be forsaken. God, have your way in each heart. For we pray in Jesus' name. Amen.